Hello and welcome to lecture number five in the hybrid electric powertrains course that deals with modeling control and optimization of hybrid electric powertrains. This course is given under the umbrella of the Swedish Electromobility Center. As you know, my name is Lars Eriksson and I'm a professor in vehicular systems at Linköping University. This lecture will go into some applications of optimal control where you'll see how dynamic programming has been used in different applications and uh, has been used as a reference for extracting the best possible behavior or the best possible control. So I will first go through a vehicle application with some introduction and motivation for why it's an important problem to study. Then I'll look at some historical results where we'll see applications of optimal control and then I will go through some of the joint research that was done between Linköping University and the Scania truck company for developing fuel optimal control algorithms. Then we'll look at another application that isn't a vehicle application directly but we'll see how the temporal planning can improve the energy and economy of a household where you have an energy storage. Thereafter, we'll jump into real-time control and look at the supervisory algorithms and go into real-time control because the previous methods have been directed to when we have complete knowledge about the driving mission or of uh, the future days. Now we'll look at what can we do if we only have information up to the present point. And that will be the topic of the online control algorithms in the second half. The first application we'll look into is that we have a truck that is driving on an open road and we have route planning that is finished so we know where we are going and we have a GPS that can help us to tell where we are on the road and what's upcoming and we can control the engine and brake torques so these are continuous controls and then we also have the gear ratio selection which is a discrete control so we can select the gear number and what we want to do is to minimize M here. M here is the total mass of fuel that has been consumed over the trip. And we also need to make sure that the trip length is less than T0 to ensure that we are not cheating because usually by driving slower we can save a little bit of fuel. But then we are making the driver spend more time in the vehicle and we might also miss a delivery time. For example if the truck is supposed to deliver a package that should go on to another distribution truck then it's important that it's there in time so that the logistics chain is working. That's why we need to make sure that we are not spending longer time or that means driving slower on the road. So to make fair comparisons we need to drive exactly the same speed or slightly faster if we are making improvements and comparisons. The motivation for doing this research is that the fuel is a really big share of the total cost of a truck ownership. A rule of thumb is one third is the fuel energy of the lifetime and one third is salaries of the lifetime and the rest is related to the maintenance and uh, service and the cost to buy it as well as taxes and insurances and it consumes 32 liters per 100 kilometers so it's quite a lot of fuel that is consumed class a trucks typically travels at operating points with high efficiency and on the other hand they are consuming 68 percent of all commercial truck fuel use and 70 percent of this amount is spent traveling on open road with a trip length of more than 100 miles as fuel is a large share of the life cycle cost it's important to make improvements there and according to industry any technology that improves fuel efficiency of these long haul trucks of half a percent is worth pursuing because it will give commercial benefit if you offer an improvement in fuel economy. Before going into a demonstrator that was developed we look at some historical results that were developed but before that we go to the vehicle motion equation once again and in this case we have the gravity here as a um, driving force that's why we have a plus here when we're going downhill positive alphas are for downhills in this equation the first step to do an analysis of optimal driving is to look at the vehicle where we have the propulsive force then we have some force that opposes the movement that depends on the driven distance s and 
on the velocity v. And we have the Newton second law here where we have the propulsive and then we have the losses due to air drag, rolling resistance and gravitation. By analyzing this, looking at uh, the propulsive energy, we're asking how much energy is needed at the wheel. So we make the same thing as we've done previously. We do the cut of the wheel and we ask the question, we're going to drive this vehicle. What is the minimum energy needed at uh, the wheel hub to drive it forward. Then we of course have an interplay between the powertrain and the driving mission but as long as we're focusing on the vehicle we can make a straightforward analysis and by looking at calculus of variations which is a component of optimal control we can see that if this loss component is convex in V which it is due to the quadratic term of the air drag losses and that we also can separate them so that we have a separate function for the distance and a separate function for the velocity so that it's separated like this and usually the vehicle speed dependence is independent of where we are on the road and as long as we don't hit propulsion limit this shows that the solution is constant speed. So the cruise controller on a conventional car, if it's good and is able to maintain constant speed, then that is the optimal. But if you hit propulsion limits and you're not able to maintain constant speed, then we have to look for another thing that's optimal. Here when we look at trucks, we have some key features. If we compare it to a conventional car, the engine power is much smaller compared to the vehicle mass for a truck. And this has the result that moderate slopes are significant and you will hit limitations of the engine so velocity variations are inevitable so we cannot keep constant speed and it's also necessary to downshift in uphills so it's not possible to keep constant speed so we have to find another solution and some challenges is that they are highly fuel efficient they are operating close to the optimum of the engines and we also need to cope with real-time requirements so that we need to be able to compute the controls during the computational time that we have available. Going to the historical result there's a paper from 1977 that looks at control of highway vehicles for minimum fuel consumption over varying terrain. That paper uses Pontryagin's maximum principle it can also be exactly the same as Pontryagin's minimum principle where analysis for gear shifts braking and throttle settings are done as the road grade changes so here they look at the car that is going for example from flat road to a small uphill or coming up over an uphill and then level out and going into a downhill and then down again and here you can see some patterns that before you go into an uphill you build up a little bit of kinetic energy and the same thing just before you come over the hill you reduce the gas pedal a little bit when you're going downhill you also start reducing the torque before you come to the downhill and then when you come to the downhill you release the gas pedal and if it's a sufficiently steep downhill you set the brake to keep it to 72 kilometers that has been the limit here now this was the first research results that analyzed the velocity profiles for different road slopes the next point is this paper by hooker it's actually a sequence of three different papers with one part on the simulation platform and then two that are related to optimal driving behavior. Hooker uses dynamic programming which you are now familiar with and he does an analysis for block sprints, hill climbing and for undulating roads and I will look at block sprint and undulating road in the plots here. So here we have a block sprint where you start at zero and then you go up and you look at how the engine is accelerating and you see the gears that are selected until you do coasting and then you do braking at the end. And here was, it was flat road and here you have undulating roads so you're going up, you're going down and up again. And here you can see how the velocity is adopted over the time. Then we have a third which is uh, the first one for heavy duty trucks. And once again here they're using dynamic programming and they look at gear and fuel economy and do look at hill climbing and they find some occasions where it's best to go to freewheeling in the downhills. 
here we see uh, the velocity profile. Once again here we see it's a little bit of planning, accelerate a little bit before and then tag along and then just before we reach the top of the hill we reduce the gas pedal and then reduce it even more and then go into freewheeling. And while it's freewheeling it is gaining speed until a controller catches it up and utilizes the gas pedal to drive it forward. These are some examples of early applications where optimal control and especially dynamic programming has been used to study these optimal speed profiles. There are some other works that also have been performed over the years. Now we'll look at some of the research that was done at our research group. I was not personally involved in the project but I was sitting right next to those who were doing it so I participated in the seminars and in the discussions. The objective here is to take the truck over this uh, varying landscape and the goal is to minimize this total fuel with respect to the trip time and the trip time must be shorter than the specified limit. And a computationally efficient approach is to do what is done in MPC. You do the receding horizon control where you look at the receding horizon and you compute the controls for that receding horizon. This is an example of receding horizon. You have a full driving mission where we are going over the full distance and then we have what's called look ahead horizon. That's the horizon that we're looking at ahead of the vehicle and we have this horizon H. So the criterion is defined for the total distance but we consider it for only the horizon that we can see. So the cost is the minimum of this horizon plus some residual cost related to the state that we have at the final point. So this R tilde here estimates the residual cost to go from where we are at A to the terminal state at point S. And now the problem is to find a fuel optimal control law for that finite horizon. This we were able to solve with dynamic programming because we have an exponential increase of complexity in dynamic programming due to the number of continuous variables. But in this case we have a low number of variables. So you will get one continuous variable in the end. So that will be easier to handle in this case. Then we have the favorable linear growth with increasing horizon length and we also need a rather long horizon about one and a half kilometer to be able to utilize kinetic energy. If we would look at alternative methods we would have complex combinatorial problems where we are selecting the gear ratio and we're selecting the speed and the nice thing with dynamic programming is that it allows general modeling and we also get guarantees for how long time will it take to compute the solution because the solution procedure is very deterministic. So we have a very good picture of how long time it will take so we can implement it in a real time system and be sure that the system will manage to complete the calculations in its given time. And we could increase the computational even more by shortening the horizon or we can give a better function for estimating the residual cost at the end of the horizon or we can use fewer grid points so we get fewer points to search over in the grid and if we combine coarser grid with interpolation together with simple integration then we can also save some and what was found in the research was that instead of using velocity as a state it is actually better to use the energy, the kinetic energy as state, then the problem becomes numerically better. So you can solve it with larger step sizes. So the problem we have in the beginning is that we want to minimize the total mass of the fuel over the horizon. And we have this given time. So we need to keep track of time. And we have a connection between time and velocity and the distance. In the original problem we have to have the time. But as you know from optimization courses. You can use the method of Lagrangian multiplier. And in this optimal control we get the Lagrangian multiplier beta. And we can move this one up here into the criterion function. So this is the Lagrangian multiplier. And then we only have two states. Whereof 
v is the continuous state that we might need to have many points for if we're doing the discretization and we have the gear that we only need to model each individual gear so even though that this problem has two states it's not exploding in size because the only thing that is increasing with the discretization is the velocity from a theoretical standpoint we can show that if problem p2 gives the same trip time as we have required here so that we're fulfilling this equality then we have a solution for p1 as well so time is no longer a necessary state so we don't need to keep track of we don't need to have a grid for the time but instead we have to find beta and this beta can be found by either shooting or you can compute approximate values for it and you can also utilize energy considerations to look at beta in terms of the kinetic energy and this is something that's called equivalence factor we'll come back to some equivalent factors related to the lagrangian multipliers in the second half so the summary we're standing here then we're solving with the dynamic programming the problem to go optimally up to this point and with only one state we have this plus we have this r tilde here which is coupled to the energy that we have at the final state and we use an energy formulation of the newton's second law so we're integrating the kinetic energy rather than the velocity and then you get the computational tractable solution for it that was the theory but the real proof of the pudding as you say is to do the eating and in this case it is to go out and do the driving so there was a demonstrator vehicle that was done in a collaboration project with Scania where Erik Hellström was an internal PhD student at our group and Maria Ivarsson was an industrial PhD student at Scania and then Jan Osland and Lars Nielsen were supervisors for them and the truck you see the data here and the controller was said to be running between 84 kilometers an hour and with a span of 5 kilometers an hour up and down and 1.5 kilometers of look ahead horizon and what is done here is then that you can utilize this span to store kinetic energy and use that kinetic energy at later points for example in uphills and also you're storing potential energy when you're going up and you're using that potential energy obviously when you're going down that's the similarity between the hybrid electric vehicles in the hybrid electric vehicles we have the energy storage in the battery but in this case we have the energy storage in the kinetic and the potential energy the way it was programmed was that Erik Hellström programmed this computer that has a GPS antenna and a road database and he did the dynamic programming algorithm and then Maria Ivarsson was giving commands to the vehicle and drove the vehicle. And she also programmed the interface so that computer could send set speeds to the vehicle and get the vehicle to act on that command and then send the current velocity and gear number back to the dynamic programming algorithm. And an example of the route that was tried several times was going from Södertälje where you have the Scania development site and you have Norrköping and it's a fairly flat highway in between these points and this is the road slope and the altitude so you're seeing we're not doing a lot of hill climbing and the slopes aren't extreme fairly small slopes but still they are significant for the vehicle the main results then LC is the look ahead cruise controller and the black is the normal cruise controller so the green is the dynamic programming based so this is four runs back and forward and the look ahead controller saves fuel and it's faster you could cheat by driving a little bit slower because that will reduce the rolling resistance and it will reduce foremost the air drag so even though that is going faster it's better in terms of fuel economy and one of the things that we're seeing here is that we have fewer downshifts the look ahead controller can plan the hill takings and can avoid downshifts that are expensive in terms of fuel economy we can look at the whole segment that is just passing over the hill at Nyköping here you have the altitude and here you have the velocity and you can see how the accelerator which is the thick one and you can see the red one is the normal cruise controller here you can see the planning that we have talked about 
before we're coming to the uphill, the look ahead cruise controller is planning very much like the Schwarzkopf algorithm initially showed. And then it goes up a little bit higher and then just before we come over to the hilltop here, we can start reducing the torque and go over to engine braking. And what we're gaining in this case is that uh, the look ahead controller can go at a longer time on the highest gear than while the cruise controller needs to go down in gear a little bit earlier and then also come up in gear a little bit later. So this gives a fuel economy benefit. And also the normal controller needs to do some braking here and some braking here to make sure that the vehicle velocity is maintained under the limits. These red ones here are pure losses because that is uh, that we've had too high kinetic energy previously. The blue one also needs to do some braking here in the downhill, but it has already planned and been down to the minimum velocity that it was set to have during the optimization. Given the conditions, it couldn't do any better than this, but it gave a significant improvement compared to the normal cruise controller. This research is presented in Erik Hellström's PhD thesis if you want to read more and has also been published in research papers and it also made it to the market so Scania implemented it and presented it in December in their product and they also mentioned that the work of, with Scania's advanced cruise control system started as a research project at Linköping University in Sweden and then they did productification of it. One way of viewing the productification is that they analyzed the dynamic programming results and then they programmed a rule-based controller based on the dynamic programming result. This is an example of driving on the same highway with the cruise controller in action. And you can see that you have this planning and they have also implement freewheeling. So in the small downhills, the vehicle goes to freewheeling. The next application that I will look at is household heating and charging of an electric vehicle. So now we're coming closer to the electromobility center's core, but we still see the same tools that we are using are applicable there. Here we're starting at midnight and we'll see how the power demand varies over the day and it's highest during the day in the morning when the factories are starting and then we go up and then down and then up again when people come home. In January we have the coldest climate and we have the highest power consumption in the system. Coupled to this is the average electric price at the time of day in 2013. So we see these variations and with these variations it becomes obvious that if you want to save a little bit of money it's good to avoid charging here and avoid charging here and place charging or heating of the house there. So use electricity when the electricity is cheap and avoid using the electricity when the electricity is expensive. The setting that we have here is we have a house that is electrically heated. In this case study there is the assumption that we have a direct electric heaters that directly give the heat. In another later study there's also an opportunity to use an accumulator tank to store thermal energy and use that to heat the house in a water-based heating system. We have electricity from the grid and this is what we're paying for and we as consumer need to heat both our house and charge our vehicle. In this we have the controller that we're looking at. We have information about we have information about the weather forecast, we have information about the electric price, we have some electric loads like using the washer, using the stove, using the dishwasher or maybe using a sauna. And then we have the heating system that also has some requirements and these are external demands like we as humans want to have a comfortable interior temperature so we have demands on what the temperature should be in the house for us to be comfortable and we also want the vehicle to be ready when we take it in the morning. The states that we have in this system is the thermal state of the house, the temperature, and we have the state of charge of the electric vehicle. And the aim with the study was to find a potential 
for savings using the radiators and vehicle charger in an optimal way compared to that you plug in your vehicle when you come home at the evening and then you let it charge so that you are sure that it will be finished in the morning. But with IoT and communication you could make some improvements and this was an investigation of how much could you gain. We have the indoor temperature and we have the state of charge that are the states. So we have two states and that is not too much for dynamic programming. The assumptions here is that the weather is perfectly known, the sock is perfectly known, the electric loads that aren't from the heater are also perfectly known. That is, we know when the stove is being turned on, we know that when the laundry machine is being turned on, we know when the dishwasher is turned on, etc. But the thing that can be changed is the charging of the vehicle and the electricity to the radiators can be optimized. And the cost function is to minimize the total energy cost of this. The constraints that comes from the surrounding and from our comfort is that the temperature is not allowed to be below a reference temperature of offset. So you have a reference temperature and there's a small offset to that reference temperature that allows a little bit of swing. And the other demand is that the vehicle must be fully charged at 7 a.m. to be ready when you, for example, leave for work. And the total power that we're allowed to take out from the network is 15 kilowatt. That is the main fuse into the house. So we have the power to the charger, we have the power to the heating, we have the state of charge, we have the interior temperature and we have the spot prices that are the same as well as the external temperature is lower during the night when it's colder. Here we see some results in the time domain and we have one heuristic controller which is the one that we plug in the vehicle when we come home and start charging. And then we have the optimal controller that does uh, planning of the charging. So it connects and starts charging at night when the prices are the lowest. And here you can see how the heuristic state of charge goes up and the optimal state of charge goes up much later. And finally here we have the power of the different controllers. And we see here how the temperature is managed quite well with the electric radiators. In the heuristic, it's a relay system similar to the electric thermostats that we have in the electric radiators today. It switches on when the temperature is below a certain limit and then it switches off when the temperature is above a certain threshold. And this is in many cases one degree. So the radiator switching on, switching off, switching on, switching off. But with the more intelligent control and temperature monitoring, it's kept down. But anyway, you can see the spot prices of the electricity. And you can see that the electricity is used the most when the spot price is low here. And when we look here, we can see how the optimal controller deviates from the heuristic controller. You have the heuristic controller, which is the left one, and you have the optimal controller, which is the right one. And in the heuristic, we do heating and charging at the same time here during the evening when we come home. And then the optimal starts to do its charging over the night and it goes in and uh, charges the most when the price is the lowest. But this is also the time when you have lower temperature and you need more heat, which is also seen here in the heuristic controller. So it's an interplay between weather forecasting and this dynamic planning. When you have this energy storage, like you have the SOC and you have the thermal energy storage in the house. You can use that to plan using dynamic programming. And we will look at the gains here. The gain in charging is a significant reduction of how much money it costs. But since the heating cost is much bigger, the total energy reduction cost is closer to the heating gains. So it's a 13% gain in total economy for the household by using this intelligent control. So this shows the first example where we have direct electric radiators and another problem where the group looked at a water accumulator. Their dynamic programming was used as the global optimal 
controller and MPC was used as a close to optimal controller and in this case it's 23 hours prediction horizon and the heuristic controller gave this amount of cost so you see that you can save money with this planning and this is an illustration of how you can use dynamic programming outside a vehicle setting and if you're interested in what was done you can go to these papers and read about the settings and all the details and with that i think we've come to a good point where we can take a break and stand up and shake out the muscles a little bit and get some blood circulation going again and get ready for the next lecture so take a break see you later bye